Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Michaela Schmidt, an outreach coordinator here at the Pulitzer Center. I'm really excited to introduce our panelists for today. Um, we have three wonderful journalists joining us. David Cortava is an editor at Foreign Affairs. Previously, he was on the editorial staff of The New Yorker. His writing has also appeared in The Nation, Harper's Magazine, The New York Times Book Review, um, and other outlets. His Pulitzer-supported project in the filtration camps illuminates the horrors of Russian filtration camps where Ukrainian civilians are being sequestered, sometimes indefinitely. Simon Ostrovsky is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and PBS NewsHour special correspondent. In 2023, Simon was honored, honored with a DuPont Columbia Award, a National Press Club Award, and a citation from the Overseas Press Club of America for his coverage of Ukraine following Russia's full-scale invasion. He led the first American TV crew in Tabuka after its liberation in April of 2022 and produced a series of reports on the atrocities perpetuated during the Russian occupation. Among his latest NewsHour reports are interviews with ex-convicts recruited by the Wagner Group and investigations into American companies violating Russian sanctions. Finally, we have Christina Zeleniuk, who has worked as a journalist for over 10 years with eight years of experience specializing in international reportage. Her work has appeared in Ukrainian outlets One Plus One and TSN.UA. She writes mainly about the EU, NATO, Russia, crimes of Vladimir Putin's regime, and the war in Ukraine. Her Pulitzer-supported project, NATO After Putin's War, explores NATO's role in the world order and in preventing future conflicts. I went ahead and shared links to all of these journalists' amazing projects here in the chat, and we'll also share those after the webinar. Our conversation today is going to be moderated by one of our senior editors, Tom Hundley. Tom? Well, thank you, Michaela, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we'll get started here. I think we'll we we run for an hour, and uh, we'll, we'll leave uh, the last ten or fifteen minutes uh, for your questions. Uh, so here in Washington, we've all been reading that the Russians seem to have regained the initiative, uh, but that the war has mostly bogged down, and that Ukraine is running out of ammunition and men. Uh, Christina. You are in Kyiv, where I believe it is 8 p.m. Uh, tell us tell us what the mood is, what people are thinking. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today here. Right now it's like, like not late, but yeah, evening in Ukraine, in Kyiv. Um, um, despite that we have uh, some problems on our Polish-Ukrainian border, nevertheless, the main topic uh, in Ukraine for many, many uh, months, um, is uh, the Western military aid and help that uh, stopped. Um, and here um, I cannot like tell you um, some, I can't open you some uh, newer information for you, but uh, just tell that uh, at the front line, the situation right now is um, bad. Uh, and um, complicated. Um, and here, I guess, um, right now in the Western media, we don't see enough coverage of uh, the real situation on the ground in Ukraine, on the front line. Uh, because, you know, for example, if you're reading some reports or uh, stories or yeah, I see broadcasting on the main uh, American, both European TV channels. Uh, we see like Ukrainian soldiers, like, you know, some iron men that can stop uh, Russian tanks only with their hands. Of course, Ukrainian soldiers are definitely iron men, but without uh, Western military aid, it's rather complicated to fight against um, Russian Federation because their mobilization capacity is much more higher than Ukraine has. And here um, I cannot also uh, open you uh, some um, new uh, stories that I can tell you that uh, this um, interview made by Tucker Carlson with Putin uh, made a lot of damage. Uh, because he has a huge audience and it was a sort of propaganda that negatively, mm, that had a negative effect 
on Ukraine inside um, uh, the US, the inside the uh, American society. And it's rather right now also complicated to um, inform American people why they should continue to support Ukraine. Um, but yes, we're still standing. So I'm open um, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Um, that's all for now. Okay, so Ukrainians are obviously reading about what's going on in, in Washington. I guess they, they all saw the, the Tucker Carlson interview and they know how a, uh, a small but a very vocal minority in the Republican Party is holding up the supplemental aid package in Congress. And of course, there's a real chance of a second Trump presidency. Trump is threatening to, to wreck NATO. Uh, he's invited the Russians to, quote, to do whatever the hell they want to NATO countries that don't spend enough on defense. <laughs> so uh, again, Christina, what, 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 do, what do Ukrainians make of all of this? Um, we as a Ukrainian journalists, uh, uh, we're literally like, uh, see this uh, interview by me, minute by minute. So we were trying to understand uh, why um, Tucker Carlson made a decision to uh, make this interview with Putin. Um, what what was the outcome of this? And um, I can say here also that we are informationally as Ukraine um, losing this, you know, war, informational war in gaps uh, in former Twitter, like X right now, and TikTok, because uh, we, for example, have seen uh, how many uh, likes were under, or comments under this interview with Putin. So, um, and American society, I guess, received here another side of the story, because the truth is on the Ukraine's side. But what have seen American people, American society, they have seen a very famous man who is like interviewing Putin and like it's another side of this war and story. So I guess it's a big damage for us, but we can work with it, increasing our presence in the social media, of course. Mm. Uh David, what, what what do you make of what's going on in Washington? I, I don't know if you have any special insights into the uh, thinking of Tucker Carlson, but I'm just uh, in alas, general, alas, I, I do not. But uh, um, you know, I, I'm a journalist, not an activist or policymaker. But a, as a citizen and as a human being, I I find um, that what's happening in Washington right now is very alarming, very sobering. Um, I, I'm especially concerned about this vocal minority of um, elected officials within the Republican Party that uh, who do not appear to appreciate that um, a threat to Ukraine is not only a threat to Europe, but to the rules-based international order such as it is. And I'm persuaded by the experts, uh, some of whom have written in the pages of Foreign Affairs, who argue that not meeting our moral obligations to our allies sends a message not only to Putin, but to this axis of autocracy to, to China, to North Korea, to Iran, that the US is not a reliable ally. And I think that's very dangerous uh, for, for everyone, including the United States. Um, you know, I, I, what happened in uh, Avdivka just recently was a, a colossal catastrophe, and it just goes to show that courage alone is insufficient to hold back Russian forces. Uh, before the start of the war, um, or, or, or since the beginning of the war, Putin's ground forces uh, have diminished by, the original ground forces have diminished by 87%, but he's managed to build them back up, and now he has more troops than he did at the start of the war. So um, Ukraine by itself, however valiant, uh, however much strength of will they have, can't go at it alone. And um, Europe by itself also can't go out alone. You know, countries like um, Denmark are basically depleting their own reserves of, of weapons. They've sent 
I, I believe all of their F-16s, they've, they've emptied the cupboard entirely. Uh, the U.S.'s role in, in holding back Putin really is critical. And again, as a citizen, as a, as a human being, I'm uh, alarmed that um, Congress just went into recess at a moment like this before putting um, the supplemental package to a vote in the House. Yeah. Simon, your uh, your recent reporting about uh, American machine parts ending up in in, in Russian weapons uh, had some impact in Washington, uh, but it seems to be drowned out by voices from the other side. What what how do how do you read the situation? Well, the wheels turn very slowly, and uh, the investigation you're talking about um, looked into machine tools that are manufactured by American companies or American-owned companies, and they're not actually the parts that go into the weapons, but they're the, it's much worse. They're the parts, they're the machines that make the weapons and the parts for the weapons. So it's like, uh, you know, instead of selling the fish, you're, you're selling... Um, you're teaching them how to fish with these machine tools, and so there's been there's there's been a lot more uh, attention since our series. By the way, funded um, in part by the Pulitzer Center's um, grants, um, there's been a lot of attention to them in Washington uh, and around the world as companies that face Russia sanctions, manufacturers in Europe, manufacturers in America who used to make a lot of money from sending these uh, machine tools to Russia. Um, now have to rethink their strategy. And, you know, as as we sort of expose these companies for what they were doing, um, they start sort of uh, switching the blame to, you know, other Western allies like Taiwan, Taiwan, who, for example, didn't stop sending these machine tools um, after our exposés. And so, you know, it's happening slowly, but country by country, region by region, uh, the Russian arms industry is being choked off from the tools uh, it needs um, to continue building weapons uh, and, and and ammunition. Um, but unfortunately, it's not it's not happening fast enough. And I've heard through the grapevine that apparently there are thoughts um, about doing legislation to sort of strengthen the legislation in, in that area in Congress. Although uh, I don't know exactly what that would look like, and I think that's. Uh, in large part, thanks to the uh, work the Pulitzer um, and we at NewsHour do together, um, I, 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 I do think that I, I take a little bit of a more sort of maybe optimistic um, stance, looking at the uh, at the way Congress hasn't been able to uh, uh, support Ukraine in the way that the Biden administration promised it would. Um, in that we now see, you know, when the United States uh, isn't isn't able to sort of stand up to the plate, um, we see European countries taking a more active role and and taking the baton. And then eventually, when things do get sorted out over here, you know, it might switch back. And so I think, you know, in, from the Russian perspective, they see this grouping of disjointed democracies who aren't always on the same page about things as being a weakness, you can also look at it as a strength because there are so many actors involved that when some of them are failing, um, others are actually stepping up and then giving the assistance to Ukraine that it needs. Um, that's not to say that obviously in the long run, if the United States doesn't get its act together, that's gonna be a huge, huge problem for Ukraine um, and for all of us consequentially. Um, but for the moment, you know, uh, just as David mentioned, countries like Denmark um, are, are doing a lot more, which, you know, would be very hard to imagine five, ten years ago. So is, is, is Putin getting stronger or is he getting weaker as as a result of, of what we've seen uh, transpire over the last month or so? And, all, and, and feel free to, uh, you know, to, all of you can chime in. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think that uh, Putin was successful enough uh, um, in imposing uh, both Ukraine and our Western allies and partners, uh, so-called the war of attrition, because it's a long war. Um, in fact, Ukraine is interested very much in um, 
a quick uh, winning this war. Uh, that is the big difference. So if uh, it's a long run, um, then we should, I don't know, um, we should have on the table all the possible scenarios. And the if it's a long run, we should have, like, as Ukraine, um, Western military help without it to win a long war of attrition is impossible for us. David, Putin getting stronger or weaker? And is, is this war winnable for Ukraine? Well, I, I, I think it is true to say that the only person who could end this war today is sitting in the Kremlin. And until there's a radical change in leadership in Moscow, I expect that not just Ukraine, but the, the collective West needs to ready itself for a long confrontation. Um, uh, th that being said, um, I, I do think that uh, all of Ru Russia is not lost. Um, I'm very proud that at Foreign Affairs, we're able to publish the authoritative analysis of uh, Russian dissidents, um, some in exile, some still in Russia, who write for us at, at great peril. Um, Alexei Mignalo, for example, a political activist still in Russia, wrote an essay for us recently titled Don't Give Up on a Better Russia. Uh, Andrei uh, Kolesnikov, another regime critic, has written half a dozen pieces for us since the start of the war. And he also remains in Russia, where he's been branded a foreign agent. The investigative journalist Andrei Soldatov, now living in exile, was branded a foreign agent directly as a result of the work that he's published in our pages. Um, just one last example, we've published Boris Bondatov, a former Russian diplomat who resigned in opposition to the war. And I, I think uh, we have an imperative to seek out sources and contributors such as these who can offer readers, voters and policymakers among them, real insight about Russia and its future. And, you know, if we're in this for the long run, I think we need to see changes within Russia, however uh, naive that sounds at this moment. Um, we do need to think about changes within Russia to to, to resolve this, this conflict that will, I suspect, play out for some time. I, I fear that a uh, a long standoff can't be sustained, and that there would have to be a negotiated settlement. Is there, Christina? Is there any stomach for that in uh, Ukraine at the moment? We have no uh, support inside the Ukrainian society. It's open data uh, information. Um, our polling agencies. Uh, uh, recently uh, just uh, published uh, a new survey um, that uh, the vast majority of Ukrainians uh, don't support any settlement on this current um, front line um, that we are stopped right now without uh, Western ammunition, military aid, and so on and so on. So um, Ukrainian society um, understands that uh, we need to win this war uh, in the internationally recognized borders of the 1991. Um, despite the fact that, in, you know, it's better than me that under the closed doors, doors uh, during off the record or um, like closed meetings, both like European American experts, politicians and diplomats, um, this scenario is about like, um, temporary settlement on this current front line is a highly is highly discussed this scenario. But uh, again, in Ukrainian society, there is no uh, support of uh, such case. Mm. Well, Simon, you you covered this from the uh, Crimean crisis in 2014, uh, the, the very beginning of what happened, well, and the, the, the Donbass, and then uh, the, the big invasion two years ago. I mean, how, how do you see this ending? Well, I can't really predict an end, but I, I do find it shocking how um, 
sort of small and how cheap our involvement from a, an American perspective has been uh, in, in in the war in Ukraine, because, it, you know, the figures that you hear quoted are, you know, in the billions and billions of dollars. But a lot of that is actually uh, weapons, old weapons, in fact, that the United States was planning on destroying um, or you know, just taking out taking out of storage or putting somewhere else. And then they attach a, a dollar figure to that and then they ship it to, to Ukraine. And then it sounds like a really big number. Um, but actually, in a lot of cases, they're saving the American people um, the cost of having to deal with that aging weaponry. So they're actually making money. It's the same for aid to Israel. Uh, a lot of the so-called, you know, dollars that we're giving them are old weapons. Um, that we would have been getting rid of anyways. So I think for the for the United States, the cost of doing the kind of damage that uh, they've been doing to the Russian military over the last two years has been incredibly low. I mean, think of all of the Russian battleships um, that have been sunk over the last several months, over the last year. Um, you know, suddenly Russia is no longer a real naval power in the Black Sea, which is something that hasn't been true, you know, since the original Crimean Wars for a couple of centuries. Um, and uh, this is all happening at pennies. And it, it's all at for the cost of a country that has openly declared that it opposes um, the, the Western order. Um, so it's it's just it's just incredible to see people on the on the right end of the political spectrum in the United States um not embracing this more especially when you consider that in the areas that Russia has taken over in Ukraine and this is a story that I'm hoping I could actually potentially get some Pulitzer Center funding to develop a little bit further but I I think it's people don't realize how oppressive the occupation uh, in eastern and southern Ukraine has been in the areas where the Russians um, have taken over in terms of how they treat religious minorities. Um, the, the southern and eastern parts of the country have a very developed Protestant and uh, evangelical movement. And uh, when the Russians take over, they put the Russian Orthodox Church on a pedestal and not only do they sort of suppress uh, other faiths, but they actually completely shut down all churches. So I'm investigating um, what's happened in a town called uh, Melitopol, which was occupied um, at the early stages of the war and didn't sustain a lot of damage um, because it was sort of just the, the Russian forces swept in and stayed and there was no fighting over it. And so it's a very good place to be able to understand what the Russians do when they have sort of complete maneuverability. And there were 14 churches there that weren't sort of affiliated with, with Russia. And every single one of those churches, including Baptist churches, evangelical churches, uh, Lutheran, Protestant, uh, Catholic, Greek Orthodox, you name it, all of them have been closed and lots of those buildings have been nationalized by the occupation authorities and turned into things like the Ministry of Youth and Sports um, of, uh, of the Russian Federation. Like shocking things that happened uh, during the Soviet, the so-called godless Soviet period are happening now in the modern Russia that's supposed to, you know, a lot of right-wingers such as Tucker Carlson um, sees uh you know the hero of the of the Christian um of the Christian movement and uh, I think a lot of the Americans the, the 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 constituency of Americans who are questioning America's support for Ukraine are the same same people who would be horrified to know um what people of their own denominations in Ukraine have gone through uh since uh, Russia occupied those areas and you know, I think if more people were talking about that, maybe that would be one of the coverage areas that could, I think at this point, two years into the war, when there is a little bit of fatigue, um, because, you know, news has to be new and it's not new anymore. Um, you have to start looking for deeper angles and for way, ways to meet your viewership rather than, you know, being angry at the viewership for not wanting to know more about the story. We as journalists have to find ways of bringing the story um, to the viewership and meeting them where they're at. And I think that that's 
that's one of the areas that I wish a lot more um, journalists were looking at, the, the suppression of religious freedom um, in the areas uh, that, that Russia has occupied. Yeah, and I know that you also make a, a, a good point earlier that we probably have to do a better job explaining that this is really a a, a terrific bargain for the U.S. The, the, the cost is, is very light. The Ukrainians are doing the, the heavy lifting and paying the heavy price, and it's 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 foolish to abandon it now. But I want to go back to something that 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 you said, David, I'm, and I'm still trying to get at whether, uh, you know, Putin is, is getting weaker or stronger. Uh, we just had a, uh, a story, it was a cover story of Harper's uh, last month uh, by one of our grantees, took a, took a boat ride down the length of the Volga and really uh, sort of clandestinely tapped into uh, Russian public opinion in a very effective way. And the sense was that Russians, uh, life is better now than it was under the Soviet Union. Don't bother us with this war in, in Ukraine. Whatever whatever Putin says, you know, it, it, it's fine. Just leave us alone. Don't draft us. Just, you know. Uh, but then when, then when Putin likely orders the execution of his, uh, his main political rival, is that a sign of, of weakness or of strength? Uh, you know, you, you you mentioned uh, these dissidents who've been writing in uh, in foreign affairs who are saying, you know, don't don't give up on Russia. There's hope, but you know, where is the hope, and and where has all of this left Putin? Mm -hmm. it, it's uh, um, it's painful to admit, but I do think that Putin's hold on power, at least uh, in in Russia, I mean, in Russia is. Is, is probably stronger now than it was at the start of the war. He has effectively wiped out civil society. He's effectively wiped out independent journalism. Um, members of my own family were living in Moscow up until the start of the war and left on the first flight they can get because they lived in the Soviet Union. They know what it's like to be in a country that you can't leave. And I don't know if you recall, but there were there was talk of Putin declaring martial law, uh, that you know flights were being grounded, and uh, a lot of um, decent people uh, have left Russia, and many of them are doing good and important work in exile. Um, but there's only so much you can do outside of the country, um, so. Uh, Russia is weaker with respect to the rest of um, the rest of uh, the world. Um, it's NATO has basically fortified in the aftermath of Putin's full scale invasion. Countries that were neutral are becoming members. Um, Europe is increasing spending on its defense manufacturing base. Um, there's concerns about what will happen if Trump comes to power, of course, but, but on the whole, externally, I think Putin is at a, at a disadvantage, but within the country, I think his, his, his regime is, is likely stronger than it's ever been. And that is sobering and, and alarming. Well, I'd like to challenge that a little bit, um, because I thought, I thought that there were some really interesting things happening um, ahead of the upcoming election, when we saw this opposition candidate, Boris Nadezhdin, trying to get his candidacy approved, um, one of the biggest outpourings of sort of allowed political activity in Russia uh, over the last couple of years centered around the campaign to gather signatures, uh, which is something you have to do in order to become a candidate um, in, in a Russian uh presidential election. And so suddenly there was this opportunity for large crowds of people uh, to go and stand in line in order to be able to sign the, the sign-up sheets to show their support for the candidate. And it's illegal for Russians to protest in almost any form. Um, but because this wasn't you know, actually a protest, but a part of the electoral procedure, 
procedure, Russians could for the first time uh, see how many of them there were um, that actually thought like each other. Because when you're atomized in the society, you're not allowed to gather in one place. You're not allowed to talk on social media about your um, anger with the government, your um, anger with the war and the policy. And then you come to sign a piece of paper and you see that there's thousands of other people who also came there. Suddenly you realize that you're not alone. And we obviously you know, and, and I think that was a powerful signal. And I, I think we don't know um, exactly what happened with the death of uh, uh, Alexei Navalny in prison, um, because we don't, I mean, I, I, of course, blame Putin and the regime for putting him into the conditions that led to his death, no matter what happened. So, you know, the regime murdered Alexei Navalny, but whether they meant for him to die right now, um, or whether they were hoping to keep him in prison for many years from now, I don't know. But if we do think that they killed him right now, that might be a signal of weakness, uh, in my opinion. After what happened with the can with the with the failed candidacy of Boris Nadezhdin, because after he got got all of those signatures, of course, um, the Russian Electoral Commission said that you know ten percent of them were not up to code or were faked or something like that. Made up some excuses so that he couldn't have his name put on the ballot. And so perhaps we can interpret the killing of Navalny as a signal um, to a signal that the regime is afraid uh, of that segment of Russia's society that is unhappy with what is happening. Um, that, you know, to a reminder that a crackdown is always around the corner. Um, but do you believe actually that uh, Nadezhdin was uh, so independent? Because I guess it was like, uh, it's my I don't think it matters, problem. Christina, actually. I don't think it matters whether he was independent or not, or whether he was a fake candidacy put forward by some, you know, shady great cardinals in the background pulling the strings. The point is, is that anybody who wanted to show that they were unhappy with the situation in Russia, this was their opportunity to come to the places to sign a piece of paper. Clearly, a lot of and people believed Clearly, a lot of people believed that this was a candidate that they could vote for um, to show their opposition to Putin. Whether he was a true opposition leader or not is almost besides the point. But it was also a great opportunity for the Kremlin to figure out how many of them uh, are still there in Russia who are not like, who can support uh, independent candidate in gaps or like opposition candidate. It's also well, like I mean, the... I think that they figured out that there was a lot more of them than they had hoped. But That's uh, my view. I, I, I just wanted to add here, we can discuss it a little bit, because I guess uh, this uh, Russian full-scale war uh, started two years ago, helped Putin actually to unite the society. And right now, for example, uh, a lot of people uh, sign... Um, Russian, Russians, I mean, sign co contract, contracts with uh, army and go to uh, kill Ukrainians because the salary is 4,000 uh, in a month. So it's such like big amount of money for, for the Russians. So I mean, that's true. There's a, there's a lot of uh, poverty in Russia and for a lot of people, there are no other opportunities besides military service. Um, Russia is under sanctions. You know, the economy isn't doing great. Uh, so people look at uh, fighting in Ukraine as a, as a sort of economic opportunity a lot of the times. Um, no argument there. Um, and that's, that's unfortunate, uh, but it's the reality. I'll just add that, you know, I, I think uh, elements of there, there's truth in what everyone is saying here. It, it really is uh, um, at times impossible to imagine a different Russia. But Russia is a country that has historically looked like nothing was going to change. And overnight it does. And so we need to um, discern and take some solace in these glimmers of hope um, from the, the the lines that are forming to to register for a, a, an opposition an opposition candidate um, 
to the writers either still within Russia or in exile who are um who are who are still writing who are who are still doing good work despite this seemingly impossible task of bringing about a different kind of Russia it's it's a challenge but I I think as Navalny said you can't give up hope what is the alternative to just accept Putin's Russia as a as a historical absolute that's never going to change so i think you're right i mean russia might be at its most brittle right now and we don't even know it right when it's trying to project strength by killing navalny is is when it might be the most hollowed out inside and when things look the darkest for ukraine uh, this might be the breaking point when the western alliance needs to push through in order to get across the finish line our, our piece in Harper said Russians arguing persuasively that sanctions had actually strengthened the economy and uh, made made it strengthened Russian industry uh, efficiencies, and uh, this was, was uh, all good for Russia. But I I find that a little little hard to believe. So. <laughs> Uh, I mean, well, certainly, it's, certainly it's, a lot of Russian factories which weren't getting business before the war started suddenly have had their orders ramped up. Um, one of my investigations focused on the Ural Track Factory, also known as the Chelyabinsk Tractor Factory, which in reality is, you know, 30% tractor factory and 70% tank engine factory, like a lot of, you know, old Soviet factories where they had the civilian um purpose on the on the sign out front but in reality they were servicing the arms industry you know that factory the director claimed has seen orders go to their highest point um ever in the history of that factory including the soviet era and that's because it's the only company that makes diesel engines in russia for russian tanks and on the one hand, you look at that and you somebody says, wow, this is great for the Russian economy. Um, on the other hand, you look at that and you say, wow, Ukraine has been destroying a lot of Russian tanks if they need to be making that many. At the point that I did the story, I think uh, it was uh, something like 600 units, sorry, 6,000 units of heavy weaponry um, had been destroyed uh, during the kind of weaponry that uses the engines manufactured by this plant. So sure, I mean, you, you might try to put the lipstick on the pig and say this is great for the Russian economy, but this is coming from the fact that uh, they're dealing with the most destructive force that Russia has um, ever faced in its modern history. None of the other wars that has ever thought fought before were, were, were ever, ever with a country that could even be vaguely described as an equal. And suddenly, when a country steps up that um, is in the same or in a similar weight category, um, Russia gets a lot more than a bloody nose. I just uh, I just quickly um, briefly add here that uh, the main source uh, of uh, um, income source for Russian economy right now it's oil export, and among three countries who which are buying. Uh, Russian oil is China, India, and Turkey. So, and the price cap uh, doesn't work. Uh, the same story with this uh, uh, way that uh, Russia found to bypass uh, Western sanctions. So we should uh, all together work here. But the main uh, challenge for us, I guess, right now is somehow to create a tool to uh, influence the Russian society inside the Russia. I don't know how to do it. Truly, frankly speaking, but we should create this tool to to stop uh, to prevent them from going to war. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, you know, the the track record on the efficacy of sanctions to actually bring about any kind of change is very spotted, um, and, and but but when they work, they work. And, you know, Anne Applebaum made this point at the Munich Security Conference a few days ago. She said, if we took um, this sanctions approach seriously, we would have a thousand people at the Pentagon working on it instead of, you know, half a dozen guys in the bowels of the Treasury Department or wherever they're sitting. And I think that's right. Um, 
the sanctions approach can be effective, but it needs to be much more robust to close the loopholes. And um, there, there's possibility there, but it, it it requires creativity and 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 real expertise. I think uh, Biden said yesterday they were going going to look at uh, a new round of sanctions. So maybe they're going to keep them up after Navalny's killing. Yeah. Uh, let me let me steer this in in another direction uh, briefly, and then we'll we'll take some questions. So I think the the, the worst case scenario for Ukraine uh, would be a second Trump presidency, and Trump pulls out of NATO. NATO. Uh, that would that would appear to be the ultimate victory for Putin, and you know, how how would how would Europe defend itself if Trump manages to wreck NATO? Maybe I I, I will I will start here briefly because uh, uh, Ukrainian dip diplomats, for example, and not only them, like politicians and experts, uh, think that uh, Trump the second Trump presidency for Ukraine can be uh, better because uh, um, it's like uh, it was uh, unofficial meetings, but I was there also. And there was such a discussion that, for example, um, where the Trump presidency, Ukraine finally can get a land lease, uh, for example. And Trump can easily like call Putin and say, come on, stop everything, or I will give Ukraine all the weaponry they they should have actually they need yet to win this war so this is um, highly discussed in kiev right now i did not know <laughs> that's interesting and i think you know the more it becomes uh, the 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 likelier the prospect of a trump pres presidency becomes the more europeans start thinking about their own defense in a serious manner you know, in in a, in, a, in a way, um, Trump's ridiculous demands that countries pay up, especially when he's talking about countries that devote more of their GDP to defense than even the United States does, particularly when we're talking about um, countries in the east of the NATO alliance. Um, but you know, whatever he says, it 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 does impact uh, what the Europeans do because they think if he's not going to be committed then suddenly it's a little scarier to be in Europe without that shield. Um, and big countries like, you know, France and, and Germany have to start thinking more seriously about whether it's, you know, a, a European uh, united command or a European army uh, is, is something that they need to start putting together. So, I mean, it, I think if Trump Trump becomes president, it's going to be very confusing, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's doomsday. Um, and I, I was also just as surprised to hear from Christina just now that some Ukrainians are actually looking at that as a potential uh, positive because they believe he has influence with Putin. David? Yeah, I mean, in, in the short term, I... I, I do fear doomsday i uh, like i mentioned earlier y ukraine just does not have enough artillery in the cupboard to supply uh sorry europe does not have art enough artillery in the cupboard to supply ukraine with everything it needs to maintain the front line um and if uh, a trump presidency means um that nato is 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 underfunded that that could be an issue that there's just not uh a sufficiently robust defense manufacturing base in europe and there's also the problem that europe has basically 27 independent defense industries there are you know some uh artillery th that doesn't match other artillery it's creating logistical um problems on the ground uh, for the for the soldiers in battle, um, I do think in the long run, this this scare that Europe is experiencing right now uh, is encouraging um, more spending on their own defense, 
more coordination uh, at the European level. And that is very much a good thing in terms of Europe, Europe's long-term security. Uh, so I'm pessimistic in the short term and optimistic in the in the long term. If I may, there's a story that maybe not a lot of people have heard about, but uh, apparently Finland is experiencing um, labor strikes. And, and uh, during one of them, the factory that makes uh, artillery shells, 155 millimeter, the ones that Ukraine needs so much, um, was supposed to go on strike. Uh, but then there was such an outcry because of, you know, the special status of the factory and the defense need um, that this factory was actually the labor unions exempted this factory from going on strike. So, you know, this is just a small example of how seriously uh, some European countries are taking the situation. And in in, in my view, good news, because, you know, we, we're used to talking about um, European countries as not being responsible um, when it comes to their own security and just relying on the United States to do defense for them. And not only is that starting to change, I think that has changed. Yeah, there's, as you pointed out earlier, Simon, the uh, the the, East, the eastern flank of, of NATO, the Baltic states, Poland, uh, I think they're, they're all paid up to Trump's satisfaction if he even knows where the Baltic states are. I think it would be like Italy that would be vulnerable to. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. The further you are from Russia, the less of your um, GDP is spent on defense, excepting the United States, I think. Okay. Well, let's let's take some questions. Uh, can you can you manage that, Michaela? Yeah, absolutely. Um... For our audience members, if you have any questions, feel free to add them in the Q&A feature or in the um, chat box. Um, David, I'm seeing that there is a question from an audience member, if you could define what you mean by in the short term um, that you're pessimistic. Is that within I, the next year or what do, you, what do you think by short term? I think for the duration of a hypothetical second Trump presidency. So hopefully we won't have to cross that bridge, but given current polling, it's very possible. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, oh, there we go. Um, there's another one that says, what story would you write that might change the review of the Republican um, mega minority? What, um, what kind of journalism do you all think would be most relevant at the moment? Maybe more stories from the front line, because I guess, again, uh, for example, Ukrainian journalists who are working mostly with the foreign audiences were trying all the last year focusing on um, covering uh, this war um, with the focus on personal stories. For example, my colleague uh, made an excellent um, uh, report um, how Ukrainian women right now uh, master men's professions because Ukrainian men right now uh, in their army on the front line. It was published in Liberation. For example, I saw many of those articles in the New York Times, CNN and so on. But I guess it still works, but I guess it's not enough. What we should do, I, I think, uh, be more presented again in the social media because, for example, Tucker Carlson, because, for example, Trump is very active there and these short videos um, are very like have very many likes and spread. So I guess it's it's our story right now. Christina, may, may I ask who who do you see now as your most important audience? Uh, Ukrainians or uh, the West for your reporting for what you know and from your vantage point? Um, I guess it's uh, Western audience, European and Europeans and both Americans uh, in social media because uh, um, many, um, again, young people, for example, and uh, people like under the 35 years, they don't simply understand why they should pay taxes more, may pour the, more their money and taxes for the defense. Why? Because they, uh, I had a, um, short uh, like discussion with some Italian 
uh, expert, and he said, literally, um, you destroyed Russian army. So Russia cannot attack NATO anymore. So why we should spend more money on defense? Sounds like something a taxi driver would say, honestly. I mean, no offense to taxi drivers. My, uh, you know, dad drove a yellow cab in New York for 10 years. But like, this, I don't know, not very convincing to me. There are more questions uh, in in the uh, in the chat. Uh, what is the state of journalism inside Russia today? Is it evolving, and do you see it playing a role in ending the war at some point? Well, well I, as I mentioned earlier, I the state of journalism within Russia is um, effectively non-existent. Um, but there are really great um, uh, reporters and, and writers and broadcasters outside of the country um, who are doing great work. And um, I shouldn't say there's nothing coming from within Russia. There is, but it's it's a you know a a, um, a kernel of what it uh, what it used to be and. Um, and even more difficult to do good, honest work um, in inside Russia. So it's it's a uh, it's it's in a it's in a crisis. I would say. Yes, uh, I, I see from the uh, the applications that that we get some projects that we're supporting. There, there's a there's a lot of good journalism by Russians outside of, of, of Russia, news organizations that have sprung up and are, are doing some really important work. Uh, I, I don't know how much of that uh, gets, gets back into Russia where it really uh, matters. Uh, probably uh, Tucker Carlson gets better play in Russia than Medusa and some of these other, other terrific outlets. I there see- uh, people, go ahead, go ahead. You know, people, uh, citizens in Russia can find um, honest journalism. Uh, you can, you know, get a VPN and access foreign sources of information. Um, there's some information flowing on Telegram, alongside lots of um, bullshit as well. Um, but uh, you know, many Russians to this day get most of their. Uh, information from state media. And that is a perennial challenge to which I don't have a ready answer. I see another question. Uh, uh, why, why doesn't Ukrainian society support negotiations with Russia at the current situation? I guess meaning at the, uh, the, 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 the current uh, uh, standoff lines um the answer is very simple because um, ukraine won't exist anymore because this uh, negotiations will be about only a capitulation of ukraine putin says publicly that um he agree um he, he is ready actually yeah to uh, those negotiations about territorial realities what does it mean it means uh, Ukraine and the West uh, to agree on uh, uh, the Russian occupation of uh, Crimea, both uh, Donetsk, Luhansk regions, as well as uh, um, other two uh, Ukrainian regions. So we need to sign this paper with Russians. Um, I guess nobody um, on the side of Ukraine uh, couldn't believe that it's possible even, I guess, um, like I just I just repeat here that uh, um, vast majority of Ukrainians doesn't support this idea, and again after all those atrocities um, mentioned by Simon, he um, researched uh, this topic a lot, and Ukrainians um, almost everyone right now has someone who were killed, who was killed or injured 
um, after, I don't know, Russian missile attack or on the front line. So um, I guess, yeah, it's the simple answer. And I we think need to see Putin. To... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. We need to see... We need to, to see Putin in the court, not at the negotiation table. I think Ukrainians have had the experience of seeing a ceasefire agreement not being implemented um, from the first round of hostilities in 2014 and 2015. And a lot of Ukrainians simply view like a, a, a negotiated uh, agreement as being a temporary and they don't trust Russia to hold to any agreement um, that it signs on to because, you know, originally it was parts of the Donetsk and Luhansk region. Um, and then Ukraine didn't do anything aggr aggressive against Russia. And then in 2022, Russia invades Ukraine again for no reason. Um, so Ukrainians look at that and they're like, OK, so let's say we signed a new deal that gives Russia even more territory. Um, who's to say that five years from now, Russia isn't going to renege on that? I mean, after all, if you go all the way back to the 90s and you'll hear, hear Ukrainians talk about this all the time, uh, the Budapest mem Memorandum, which Russia signed on to in this memorandum, Russia um, promised to respect Ukraine's borders and to... Uh, actually protect those borders. Um, uh, and, and, and obviously that didn't happen. So there's not a lot of faith um, that negotiations could produce an agreement that Russia would actually stick to. And uh, in fact, the main reason for Putin to sign this agreement, uh, I guess, is uh, he hopes, Russia hopes that um, uh, actually the Western uh, military aid stop, and that's all, full stop. So uh, for the Western societies, I guess they will question why we should pay for uh, the military help for Ukraine uh, if they are at the negotiate, uh, they conducting their negotiations with the Russian side. So I I just want to add. Well, first of all, I think whether the Ukrainian leadership decides to enter into any kind of talks with Russia is up to Ukraine. Um, it's up to the democratically elected leadership in Kiev. Um, but but apart from that, you know, it's it's I think useful to note that um, this is not Russia's first invasion. Um, in my native Georgia, where I was born in Tbilisi in two thousand and eight, um, Russia came and took a fifth of the territory. Uh, the world didn't step up. Um, to support Georgia in that moment. Um, no no major sanctions were imposed on uh, the Putin regime. And I think uh, that signal to Putin that you, you can proceed, basically. Um, at this point, I think it's clear to most observers that Russia is not a normal European country but a expansionist totalitarian state and that requires a a different kind of logic with uh in terms of how you interact with it so well i i think that's a, a good note to end on unfortunately we 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 have more questions but we've run out of time uh so i wanted to thank you all for a uh for a very good discussion and uh, thank our audience for good questions. I wish we could have gotten to more. I probably should have stopped sooner to allow you to, uh, to uh, get all your questions in. But again, uh, thank you for coming and, and panelists, uh, thank you uh, for a great conversation. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank Thanks everyone.